Okay, so yeah, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Cal. Um, I'm today I'm presenting my just a tiny bit of the research I did for my master's thesis at the University of Southampton, which is focusing on machine learning for shipwreck detection in the UK. Tiny bit of background to begin with. So in recent years, we've seen a massive explosion in the amount of data that's uh, not only accessible, but increasing in its resolution, um, particularly in archaeological remote sensing. Uh, we have things like LIDAR, for instance, now down to centrometric resolution in many areas of the UK. And we're seeing this uh, also increasingly in the maritime context um, in the light of increasing um, offshore developments, but also for the push for global seabed mapping as well. So this is obviously great for us, more data to look at, but it brings its own challenges, uh, but new opportunities as well to be able to effectively analyze such large data sets. And one of the solutions to this is the increased use in uh, semi-automated methods, of which I'm just going to talk about one. I'm going to focus on machine learning, but there's so many I could talk about. Um, uh, but I just don't have time, unfortunately. Um, so we're seeing an increased use in these methods, particularly in terrestrial contexts. But uh, I would perhaps say that still remain a bit underutilized in maritime context specifically. So I wanted to assess the feasibility and potential for applying machine learning techniques for shipwreck detection in the UK, specifically using bathymetry data. And part of that, I wanted to create and test new detection models using both bathymetry as well as hill shade to detect shipwrecks. So what makes machine learning different is that it does not um, explicitly rely on the need to know uh, the exact characteristics of an object prior to its detection. Instead, these object properties are seen as learnable and teachable to a computer. This is done by providing the computer both positive and sometimes negative instances of an object class, and it's able to learn its characteristics. By doing so, these methods are attempting to reproduce the same logic we humans use when we look at and identify an object in an image based on our prior experience. The crucial thing here is that the machine learning algorithms are able to continually improve their detections over time uh, through, the, uh, through more training data. And we're seeing an increased use in these uh, applications, particularly in archaeological remote sensing, uh, because machine learning is really adept at classifying large and really complex data sets. These methods have actually been around since at least the 1990s in archaeology, um, but particularly since the 2010s, we're seeing their use increase as they're now really able to effectively use 3D topographic data sets, which is greatly enhancing their ability to detect uh, even subtle archaeological sites and features. So again, just two quick examples of the types of semi-automated methods ongoing currently with bathymetry data for shipwreck detection. This is a really interesting paper that was really uh, inspirational for my research from a couple of years ago. Uh, these researchers used a sort of topographic inference approach. So this is a, just a section of their research area. Uh, this is a DEM of the seabed. And they're using this elevation data to automatically extract potential seabed features. And they're doing this by specifying uh, certain criteria for the computers to auto extract, be it uh, the size or the slope, for instance, of potential seabed features. In their study area, the man uh, manual analysis was able to identify 150 wrecks. And this automated approach was able to identify 107. Uh, the remaining 43, only 10 could be identified manually. So it's, it's performing really well. But the big difference here is uh, to, take, to manually identify those wrecks, it took the researchers 10 hours. The semi-automated approach took three minutes. So turning specifically to an example of uh, machine learning now, um, here are some really interesting results from a paper called, uh, from Character et al. a couple of years ago where they're able to have trained a machine learning model to detect shipwrecks with over 90% accuracy in its detections. And we're seeing some examples here. The numbers in the boxes are just um, the confidence score that the algorithm is outputting, whether or not how confident it is in that detection is a shipwreck. And they were also able to do this um, at different resolutions as well, which is really interesting to think about potential uh, further applications for marine survey. So a brief overview of my own methodology before getting to the specifics. Um, all the handling of the geospatial data was done through ArcGIS Pro, including the machine learning applications. It did have some computational requirements, specifically a good GPU, and also the downloading of specific deep learning packages in Python, which are freely available. Uh, these just facilitate the use of the machine learning uh, tools in ArcGIS Pro. 
So that's the platform that we were working from. Now the data that I was using uh, was bathymetry data. Uh, it was freely accessible from the Admiralty Seabed Mapping Service. And that formed the basis of the detection. Now in conjunction with this, I was using the UKHO's uh, Rex and Obstruction Database, which allowed me to evaluate the semi-automated methods with my own manual analysis. So that formed three, three parts of the analysis of my research. One was the manual analysis, like I said, which provided a baseline level of shipwreck detection. And the two machine learning approaches were one using a pre-trained shipwreck detection model provided by Esri. Um, this has been trained on existing bathymetric data sets, which I was able to apply to my own study areas. And between the manual identification and the Esri one, these provided really effective ways of evaluating my own custom machine learning models, which I created two of. One uh, using the bathymetry data as the input, and the second one using Hillshade as the input. And the outputs from that, like I said, the baseline detection from the manual. And the outputs from the machine learning are just simple shape files, really um, GIS friendly, of detected features on the seabed, uh, either being correct or in incorrectly identified uh, shipwreck features. So the data I was using was the highest resolution possible that I could download with one meter. Uh, this was done in an attempt to increase the accuracy of the detections. And to all the data, I applied a Hillshade uh, tool. This was in, a, in an attempt to increase the visibility of shipwrecks. Um, like I said about the human logic, it's working the same as uh, humans do when we try to look for visual patterns in data. So increasing the visibility was hopefully going to increase its detections. So that's the extent of one meter bathymetry data in the UK that I used. Um, I broke it down into completely arbitrary regions based on geographic extent, mainly because the computer was smoking slightly if I tried to run it all on a single layer. Um, so it was a lot, about half a terabyte worth of data. By doing so, I was able to break it down better into training and testing regions as well. So about 85% of the data was used to train the model. And that came from the northeast, east, and southeast regions, while the last 15 or so percent was used in the final testing, reserving it right until the end uh, so the computer hadn't seen it before. So yeah, putting some numbers to that, about half a terabyte covering 4,600 square kilometers of seabed. So looking specifically at the workflow now, that's what we've covered so far, the platform that I'm working from and the type of data that I'm handling. Then I, uh, once that was in place, I could start preparing the machine learning model. And this was done in two initial steps. The first one was going in and manually identifying and capturing training samples with the use of the UKHO's database. Uh, I managed to capture around 540 known shipwrecks, which is about as fun as it sounds. Uh, it took a while. But once those were in place, I was able to extract uh, those examples into simple image forms, just tiles of JPEGs. Um, using the bathymetry and the hillshade. And those, that forms the basis of the training uh, for the model. So to increase uh, pot the potential accuracy of the model, I wanted to expand the training data set and give as much training opportunity as possible. This was done through simple augmentation uh, just by rotating the images. So one original image chip by rotating at 90 degrees each time gave me four images in total. And it's really important because the computer treats each image as a unique image in itself and is able to learn those properties of the shipwreck. So from the 540 manually identified shipwrecks, that created 3,700 images to train on uh, with augmentation. The specifics of the algorithm itself was a single shot detector with ResNet 50. These are both uh, really accurate um, machine learning detection algorithms, which have been used extensively, and they're designed specifically for object detection and imagery. Many different exist. Uh, I just chose these two because they were really uh, easily be able to integrate into ArcGIS Pro. So once the model was trained, I was then able to move on to the final testing in the south region. And that looks something like this. We will hopefully look a bit uh, closer at the back there if you can't see this. These are just results from the bathymetry and the hillshade running in parallel um, so I could compare them directly. The number in the box is its confidence score again of how accurate it thinks it is. So the first round of results I was getting was from the training stage and this was to see how well the model was performing from the training data. 
Partly this is generated from a validation data set, which is a specified amount of data withheld from the original training data in order for the model to test and evaluate its own performance. From this, we get an average precision score. Um, precision is the percentage of accurate detections out of the whole. Uh, both models got 77%, uh, which is pretty high. It was really encouraging to see. Not too surprising that they, they, were, they were the same as they were trained on uh, the same data. Another way of evaluating uh, the training stage was to look at comparative figures between ground truths and predictions coming from the validation data set. So that looks something like this. On the left hand column, we have ground truths, i.e. examples that I provided the machine learning model in uh, as the training samples. And on the right hand column, we have its own predictions after learning the characteristics. And we can actually see that the one for one match uh, for each of these samples, a so really good alignment and it's able to identify them well. And the same thing for the hillshade again. On the left, the, the examples that I've given it, on the right, uh, its own predictions. Now, the final part of the training was looking at another way of evaluating the performance over time throughout all the training cycles. And this is done through something called a, a loss curve graphs. And there's two types of curves in this. The first one is a train learning curve, and that's how well the model is able to learn from the training data set itself. And there's a validation learning curve, which is how well the model is able to generalize based on that uh, withheld 10% across uh, the training data. So in visual terms, it looks something like this. This is an example or a good fit training example of the model learning in basically optimum conditions. We have the two curves, train and validation. On the x-axis, we have time or the number of uh, training cycles. And on the y-axis, we have loss or in other words, accuracy, the higher the loss, the more inaccurate the model is. And we can see near zero at the start of the training, it's really inaccurate. There's a high amount of loss, but there's a steep um, decrease or increase in accuracy where the model is learning efficiently. Um, and there's really good alignment between the curves coming to a point of stability. Now, if we compare this exemplar to the results that I got from the bathymetry in the hill shade, we can see that the, both models are performing very well during the training. Um, there's a steep uh, increase in the accuracy early on. It's being able to learn well from the training data set. Overall, the bathymetry is doing slightly better in terms of its generalization. Uh, there's some couple spikes and separation in the two lines with the hill shade, but uh, overall, they're performing very well. On to the final results of the testing phase now. So through manual analysis, I was able to identify 197 uh, shipwrecks in the testing region. No doubt I would have missed some, uh, mainly due to human error, but this gives a good baseline level of detection that I can compare my own results to for the machine learning. Now, unfortunately, the Esri model didn't detect anything. Um, no accurate detections, uh, but this can be explained. So on closer review of the tutorial that it's provided with, it seems that the Esri model was trained on uh, bathymetry data that include dense clusterings of much smaller, very modern shipwrecks, like from a harbor, for instance, following a hurricane. Now, when I'm applying that to the UK bathymetry data, which is containing isolated shipwrecks, maybe 100 meters plus long in length, it's actually failing to detect those because it's outside of its learned parameters. Thankfully, mine performed a little bit better, otherwise I could just stop talking now. We can go have a copy. <laughs> So the first things that I was looking at were the true positive detections, that is where the machine learning models are accurately detecting the shipwrecks on the seabed. And here's an example of intact, well-preserved wrecks being detected by the models. Hope you can see that at the back. On the left-hand side, we have the uh, detection model using the bathymetry. On the right, we have the hill shade with uh, the confidence score in, in the boxes there. So really nicely in, uh, intact shipwrecks being detected. Interestingly, though, we're also being able to detect disarticulated wrecks, which is really exciting to see. Much less visually prominent, um, but both models are able to detect these types of wrecks as well, which is really great to see. And there was some overlap between their results as well. Actually, the top four, A to D, there was no overlap. So interesting questions starting to be raised about why one model is detecting them, but not the other. The second part of evaluating the testing results was looking at the false positive detections. That are uh, detections that are incorrect. Uh, there's no shipwreck existing there. And that 
mainly was seabed features like this, like rock outcrops, some sand dunes, things like that, where the model is incorrectly identifying these features as shipwrecks. Unexpectedly, though, there was also some data errors which are being picked up. Uh, these are actually no data values, which have been clipped out perhaps from overcleaning, but we can see why the model might be mistaking these as shipwrecks. There's, they're seemingly distinct from the background topography, they have bright color values, and they're linear features. So that was a bit unexpected, but good to know going forwards. Perhaps the most interesting to me, though, was looking at the results that were the false negatives. So these are intact shipwrecks that were being completely missed by the algorithm. And those look something like this, which is really interesting to me. We have uh, really intact, distinct wrecks from, uh, from the background topography to us looking similar to the ones it was detecting earlier. So some really interesting questions being raised about why this is happening, and that comes down to the training sample I'll talk about later. Putting some numbers to that then, uh, overall, bathymetry models, uh, the bathymetry in the hillshade model was able to detect roughly the same amount of wrecks. That's the, that's the true positive. The big difference is looking at the precision of that detection, and that's where we look at the false positives. So the hillshade is about 50% more precise in its detection than the bathymetry. From those numbers, we can calculate uh, further standard accuracy measurements to further evaluate it. Uh, so overall, the recall is the uh, number of detections out of the total in the study area. So it's not great, about 45% for both, but we see the big difference there in the precision using the hillshade. So overall successes. Well, despite the low accuracy, we were able to identify both intact and disarticulated wrecks, which is really interesting to see. And I was able to show well that the hillshade visualization did improve detection uh, specifically in its precision. There were some problems, however, with low accuracy. And the biggest thing, I think, is coming from errors in the training samples I was able to later identify. On close review of the image ships that are used to train the models, there was actually inclusions of plain background seabed topography uh, in the shipwreck training samples as well. This is a problem that I tried to uh, get rid of but wasn't totally able to eliminate. So this is starting to introduce errors in inaccuracy into the detection itself, which is resulting in high false positives of seabed topography. Now, if we compare my results to the earlier study that I mentioned, they actually used much less training images than I did, but they were able to achieve vastly more accurate results, that 90 plus percent accuracy that I mentioned earlier. And this is because they used that background topography in their training samples as a separate detection class. So they were able to train the model to detect shipwrecks as well as not what, what not to detect in the background topography. I really want to test different algorithms in machine learning detection. Uh, many exist, I just used two examples. Uh, they all do slightly different things to do the same ultimate end goal. So it'd be really interesting to evaluate them further and test them. I need to improve the training data, either through augmentation, but definitely through including background topography samples in the training. And once we have established a really accurate detection model, we can go beyond detection and start thinking about site classification and answering more archaeological questions about how intact these wrecks are, what type of wreck site it is, and so on. And actually, we're seeing now, from a couple of years ago, the real-time integration of these techniques into marine survey. So this is side scan sonar data from an AUV. Uh, and the machine learning algorithm is, is detecting seabed anomalies that are of potential archaeological interest in real time. Here we can actually see it's detecting a shipwreck. And what they were able to do is, uh, in real time, change and alter their uh, monitoring strategies to better target these potential sites. So in conclusion, today presented here was just a, a real baseline study. There's so much work to be improved on. Um, and yeah, I really had to speed run through. There was so much that I had to leave out. Um, I was able to show the importance of using visualization to increase the visibility of these sites. Um, which is going to help improve the detection going forwards. And I hope that I was able to show uh, reasonably feasible applications in the future for these sorts of techniques once we're able to counter those uh, inaccuracies and remove them from the training data. As I mentioned, the biggest step to this would be to really focus more on the training data and improve it. But there's some really exciting possibilities in the future, um, and I can't wait to share with them uh, at some future date. So thanks very much for listening and look forward to your questions.